Welcome, everyone, to the PFF Fantasy Podcast. I'm your host, John Macri, fantasy analyst here at PFF. And we got a full house today, ladies and gentlemen. We are just a few days removed from the 2024 NFL draft. So we know there are going to be a ton of rookie drafts going here in the next month or so. So, I mean, some of them have already started. I, I'm, I'm in like five myself right now with many more to go. So today, to help you get ready for those rookie drafts, we're doing a live rookie mock draft with some brilliant minds of the PFF Fantasy team, which includes Kate Majuk. Nathan Yonke and Nick Bodiford, a full house. Like I said, we look like the Brady Bunch here on screen, or at least the intro to the Brady Bunch uh, <laughs> uh, on the YouTube. But um, gang, how you all doing NFL post NFL draft week? Uh, Kate, we'll start with you. I'm doing good. This was a very weird NFL draft, like very suspect. Um, there was a lot of sort of like duplicative picks, I thought, especially in terms of running back skill sets that really it, i'm in a couple rookie drafts have totally pushed rookie running backs down draft boards a bit but what i was saying to you guys pre-show is like in all of my super flex rookie drafts none of them look alike and i think that makes for a lot of fun because we really are still kind of drafting based on assessment and it's kind of this this who's who what's your flavor and i I love that vibe instead of consensus. Boo consensus, yay vibes. Absolutely. Yeah, this is the fun part of, of kind of going through this mock draft. We'll get some different takes on it, and that's why we got four of us here today. How about you, Nick? How are you feeling after the NFL draft? Have you started any any rookie drafts yet? So I have not begun. I think my earliest rookie draft starts on Friday, but it, it we might have a couple kicking off. I'm starting to see messages uh, in across some of my leagues where people are – indicating that they uh they now want to move the draft date up because they're excited okay. um uh, i'm 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 pumped for this i kind of uh picked my draft spots strate strategically because i think i i'm trying not to to have to make the hard uh decisions and see where you guys fall um and i'm looking forward to it how are you john <laughs> I'm doing great. I think that's a, that's a fair way to do it. And, and and yeah, if you haven't had a rookie draft yet, it's a good little like practice run to get in there as well, just to kind of get a sense of maybe where people are valuing valuing people um, or players. But yeah, Nate, you got your rankings up on the site as well today. So how you feeling at post draft here about where these guys are going to go? You feel like you got a good handle on it, or are you ready to shake things up a bit? Uh, I feel like I have a decent enough handle of where I view things. I know it's going to be different than how everyone else does. I've seen some consensus rankings already, and it's all over the place. Yeah, Just like even within the position, figuring out which wide receivers you like based on landing spots, running backs, there's a lot of interesting decisions. So I would like to apologize to our editors after spending all day Sunday, as well as the previous couple of days working on my rankings. But I don't think I got that rankings turned into them until about 10 or 11 PM Sunday night for them to publish Monday. But I think right now they're in an okay spot at least. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I put mine out. Um, I think they came out Monday as well. And yeah, just spent like pretty much all my free time between Saturday and Sunday trying to, to trying to sort it out. It's it's not easy, but that's why we're all here. Um, there, there's four of us, but we're going to be drafting for, for 12 teams across at least two rounds, maybe three, depending on time. But um, that's why we got the whole crew here, just kind of taking turns. I, I think it'd be a bit harder to organize with any more than four. So we'll each get three, three picks per round uh, to make it easier. And like we said, we're, we're doing uh, super flex or two QB format as our template here for this draft. So naturally that's going to push up the value of those rookie quarterbacks as well. Um, if you don't play super flex, that's okay. Um, just pay attention to the, you know, the offensive skill position players, be sure to check out the free one cookie, one, one cookie, one quarterback rookie rankings uh, we have on the website as well. And uh, yeah, if there's enough, of an appetite for it we we can always come back and do a one qb rookie draft as well there's there's an option there too so um this will be fun kate's got the first overall pick uh nate's got second nick's got third i got fourth we're gonna get into it before we do i just want to give uh people a quick reminder about the pff mock draft simulator promo that we still have going even though the nfl draft is over it's code 30 mds for 30 percent off an annual subscription i know the 2024 nfl draft is over but you might already be looking forward to the 20 
2025 NFL draft like an absolute sicko. And let's be honest, how can you not be hungry for more of that sweet NFL draft content? And if you are looking for more, the PFF Mock Draft Simulator has you covered as it is loaded up with 2025 prospects so you can get in there, do some way too early mock for your team or the entire league, however you want to approach it. Use the promo code 30MDS right now on PFF.com to get 30% off annual subscriptions, which includes all of our NFL draft content and, of course, access to the best mock draft simulator in the league here at PFF. So check it out now. Go do a 2025 mock draft because why not? Again, that is promo code 30MDS. All right, let's go. Rookie draft season officially underway. So what better way to uh, podcast post NFL draft than to do our own rookie mock draft? We're going to get right into it here. Uh, again, this is super flex, two QB format. And of course, Dynasty, since you don't do rookie only drafts for redraft. So let's start off with pick 101. Kate, you are on the clock. Who are you taking to kick things off? Caleb Williams, the Chicago Bears quarterback. You could have already penciled that in. But, uh, you know, I, I think... All things considered, like you're just drafting Caleb Williams for this generational ability to play the quarterback position. He's got a bit of a, a dual threat skill set, though that's not the pinnacle of his game. You love to see his ability and athleticism outside of the pocket, ability to create plays when things break down. Like all of these things are going to be huge assets to Caleb Williams. You add in the personnel that they got this guy in year one. I have to imagine Justin Fields is sick to his stomach watching them build around Caleb Williams before he's even stepped foot in the city. But you've got Williams, you've got Keenan Allen, you've got uh, a solid running back core, you've got Roma Dunze. Like there's uh, a, a lot to like here. And then you pair him with DJ Moore on top of that. Like there's a very real possibility that Caleb Williams is a year one top 12 QB, maybe top 10, especially when you consider the personnel they're surrounding him with. Yeah, it's a, it's a great situation. I, I'm with you. I have Caleb Williams at 101 for, for super flex as well. I, I've seen it go both ways, though. I, I've seen other people take um, Marvin Harrison Jr. in this spot. Um, there's people maybe like Jaden Daniels a little bit more as well. But uh, I, for the most part, it's been Caleb Williams with some Marvin Harrison mixed in there. So, Nate, you got the second overall pick. Are you going quarterback next? I know you got a Cardinals jersey on. I'm wondering if it is for a reason. Uh, yeah, I'll be going from one Cardinals great wide receiver to the next. I'll be going with Marvin Harrison Jr. for my pick. I do have Harrison Jr. just slightly ahead of Williams in my dynasty ranking. So if I had the 101, that's where I would lean. Um, I just think Harrison's a safer pick in terms of how good I think of a prospect he'll be. I think very highly of Caleb Williams as well. And I think really they'll come down to who you have on your roster. I'm perfectly fine with going with, if you're solid at quarterback, go with the wide receiver. If you're solid at wide receiver, go with the quarterback. So kind of depends on your league. But I think Harrison, he's someone that in redraft leagues, I'll be perfectly fine starting him week one, whoever Arizona's opponent is. I just think he is that good of a player and that well-polished. And I think in the Cardinals offense uh, with Kyler Murray, sure, there's some better quarterbacks in the league, but that's also a fairly good situation for him to land with. Nice. Yeah, I love it. I mean, Marvin Harrison, clear 101 in, in one QB leagues. And I think, again, just based on what I've seen already in rookie drafts, there, there's an argument for him here at the top as well. So Marvin Harrison Jr. and Caleb Williams off the board. Nick, 103 goes to you. Are you going to go wide receiver or are you going quarterback now? You get the, the fun choice as well. Yeah, I'm going to go quarterback. I'm going to go Jaden Daniels, Washington Commanders. The, the decision here for me is between Jaden Daniels and uh, New York Giants wide receiver Malik Neighbors. I do think neighbor like I think Brian Dable's job depends on uh, Malik Neighbors. So I I'm not really worried about the the poor environment there. But um, what Jaden Daniels can do in his rookie season, I think, is extremely exciting. He it's when I was compiling. The, the rookie rankings are, are, are easy comparatively when you're when you're looking at the top 12 super flex and you're trying to rank the rookies within, you know, the, the NFL player pool. This is one of those where you want to rank the guy inside the top 12, but he's just like stuck at 13. I think ultimately I'll, I'll settle on on Daniels is like the QB 11 QB 12, but it's it, it's he's sitting right there at 13 right now. Um 
What I like about Jaden Daniels, he he gets knocked for being kind of slender, but he is he's you know he's six four two ten, so he is at least two ten. He's he's slender, no doubt, but this isn't like a uh, you know a, a Bryce Young sized player. Per the uh, per, per PFF's uh, draft guide, Daniel scored a 93 grade or higher in all five passing related stable metrics. If you want to go look at what really matters most, though, his his rushing upside. So over the last two years, the uh, there have been four players each season who have averaged 21 fantasy points or more at the at the quarterback position. Uh, five of those. Average six or more rushing attempts. Attempts seven of them average three point six or more. Daniels is coming off a season where he averaged nine point two rushing attempts per game. I don't expect that to be entirely sticky, but it just kind of drives the point home that this guy is going to run a lot. He's also very very good. I think he makes his own case for being just the best pure rusher in this class. Average ten point four yards per carry. So I'm going to take Jane Daniels here at the 1.03. There will be elements to Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he doesn't move the wide receivers around. That will frustrate. But we know that he is going to funnel looks to Terry McLaurin. And there are far worse players that one could be stuck funneling targets to. So I'm, I'm feeling okay about that overall. Nice. I love I, this I, pick. Yeah. And I'm like all in on Jane Daniels. I will say like, I want to I want to touch on the the size component because obviously I feel like that's kind of been the biggest discussion of Jane Daniels is not the the height obviously but the frame and I actually don't have as big a problem with the frame but what I do have a problem with is the way that he takes hits it's pure reckless football and it, the dude I mean every time he gets hit he I, it feels like he hasn't learned how to absorb a hit. And if you haven't learned to absorb a hit at the, the college level, I have to imagine you might get a rude awakening when it comes to the pros granted LSU, like he had it, you know, he had experience within a, a respectable conference. I'm not arguing that, but like he got blown up every time he got hit. Cause he doesn't know how to take a hit. And that does scare me a little bit from dynasty perspective. If he doesn't learn to better protect himself um, in that regard, but like from an upside perspective, I think you could definitely make an argument that while his, his floor isn't as high as, as Caleb Williams, because of that rushing upside, his, his ceiling might be a bit higher for fantasy than even Caleb Williams in that regard. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. And and look, the, I mean, we, we just saw it last year, right? With the these uh, with a rushing quarterback who took a lot of hits and got hurt, right? Anthony Richardson unfortunately didn't make it through even five games um, as a rookie, right? So it's definitely one of the concerns there with Daniels. But yeah, I really like the landing spot. I, I like the potential there for for fantasy upside with his rushing game. Um, so yeah, this this top three makes perfect sense to me. This is exactly how I have them in my super flex ranking. So with back-to-back -back picks, I get to keep my super flex rankings intact here um, because with the 104, I'm going to go with uh, Malik Neighbors. So Malik Neighbors, to me, I mean, look, it, it was a pretty clear, clear cut top three, top two, however you want to look at it, wide receiver in this year's draft class. I know people don't love the landing spot going to the New York Giants because, look, Daniel Jones might not even be back to start the year. There, there's question marks even about him long term. What's that going to look like? But have to imagine that the talent, you know, overcomes here and long term, I think this is still going to be a great spot for Malik neighbors. We got to imagine they're going to get better there um, in New York at some point. Uh, but either way, Malik Neighbors is like the clear-cut top wide receiver on this New York Giants team. We know the talent. We believe in that. So imagine he's going to get a ton of targets right out the gate. So I still really like Malik Neighbors here uh, in the second spot. Um, and then my next pick, I, I mean, this is where... I think I'll go quarterback again now. So we'll just kind of take um, turns here going quarterback, wide receiver, quarterback, wide receiver. Um, and I'm going to go with Drake May. So this one, it maybe changes, varies depending on on the person. Um, if you like the, the situation that Drake or that uh, JJ McCarthy landed in a little bit better, because I know the Patriots 
aren't a sexy landing spot, but in Superflex, you know, you're getting a, a locked in starting quarterback, even if it isn't week one, like taken third overall now by this new Belichick list regime. Um, he, he's going to be given every opportunity to start all the evidence coming into the draft as far as what he's accomplished over the past two seasons as a starter um, he says that he's a high-end prospect worthy of being taken top three in the NFL draft. He's going to get plenty of opportunities to prove that now at the NFL level um, tiebreaker for me between him, JJ McCarthy, even though McCarthy has the better weapon weapons was just the rushing upside. Um, like he, he Drake may wasn't afraid to take off in college. He was really good at it as well. 8.3 uh, rushes per game for his career, over 1500 rushing yards. You pair that with 89th percentile pass grade since 2017 98th percentile big time throw rate um and doing so without necessarily like the high-end supporting cast that that some of his peers had in this class so i'm optimistic about drake may I, i'd feel very comfortable taking him here um at Superflex. so be interested where where you guys would have would have gone here if, if it would have been the same or if you would have uh went somebody else i'll say it yeah. um i think the argument definitely is there for jj mccarthy and I mean, all things considered, J.J. McCarthy has been one of the most polarizing prospects. I think you either love him or you hate him. I'm closer, like, generally speaking, even before we knew the landing spot, I liked J.J. McCarthy a little bit more than I think the bulk of fantasy analysts. When I turned on the tape, I thought he looked a, a lot more athletic than the stats would have indicated. Like, I don't think he's going to be a statue in the pocket. You're setting him up with this excellent weaponry. You have Aaron Jones now in Minnesota, who's one of the best receiving backs in the league. Like, I think you can make the case perfectly. It's kind of like a pick your poison. If you're going to roll solely based on talent, then I think you go Drake May. If you're going towards situation with the question mark and the talent component because of the things he wasn't necessarily asked to do all that often in Michigan's offense, then maybe you go McCarthy, but I literally think it's one of these pick your flavors situations. And I don't know that there's a wrong one. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. It, it, it's a trickier spot now, right? Like once you get out of that top four, I think that's where we really start to see things kind of vary quite a bit. So Nick, you're up here at one Oh six. You got an option. You got a few options here, um, quite a bit. Uh, where where would you be going um, with this six pick? So I I try not to let uh, positional need dictate the pick too much, but I, I think that it can be somewhat of a tiebreaker. Since I've already gone Daniels, I feel a lot better about pivoting to wide receiver here and, and drafting Lad McConkie, L.A. Chargers uh, number one. I, I think that, that J.J. McCarthy... So he is he's an he is an efficient rusher. It's I don't think it'll be uh, enough for him to be a, a a high impact fantasy asset, but I I do think he's going to be a good quarterback, and I think he'll be a quarterback for a long time. So he certainly intrigues here. Um, for me, though, what I'm looking at with Lad, the guy <clears throat> the guy landed in basically the ideal uh, spot where Harbaugh has has cleaned house. It's Josh Palmer who just peaked. I, I think I think is uh he had a career high. It was 1.7 something yards per out run last year. Prior to that, he was stuck in like 1.2. I think that Josh Palmer, that is. Um, I, I think Palmer is like a capable number three or four, but him sitting atop the depth chart is ideal for an NFL ready route runner. This is also kind of a unique situation. You compare this to the New York Giants. Um where they've got a, a, you know, ACL reconstructed Daniel Jones back there. Justin Herbert, it was like two years ago, we were talking about him versus Patrick Mahomes. The guy can still play. I don't think that the, the passing volume will be as high as I want it to be, but they're going to run with a decent pace of play. Greg Roman is a good play designer. Um, I think McConkie is just going to like walk into 120 targets here. And I, he, he, he wins on the perimeter. He's very good in the intermediate to, to deep zones. He's, he's not like the, the kind of slot receiver that he was kind of billed as. Uh, I think he can be a, an efficient high volume 
fantasy relevant wide receiver in year one. So Lad McConkey for me uh, at 106. Nice. I like it. That is the um, earliest I've seen Lad McConkey go anywhere. So Nick, I want to give you some kudos. You got bold today. <laughs> bold. Thank you. Bold. Um, I'm just hoping you guys leave me my guy here uh, at the turn, but who's next at the 107? I'm next. Yeah. Yeah, Nate, who do you got? Um, I, even though I'm the only one who hasn't picked a quarterback yet, I'm going to stick with my draft board, and I'm going Rome Adonze next. Wow. Um, I know I, Kate was saying at the top of this how interesting this draft was, and I think part of that is how much different my rankings are and everyone's rankings are in terms of redraft versus dynasty in this class because there's a lot of players who I have them higher in dynasty and lower in redraft or vice versa. So there are other wide receivers that I think will have a better rookie year, but just in terms of the talent that he has, and I think the gap in talent between him and all the wide receivers picked after him, even if it's not this year, I think long-term he will end up being the better option. Uh, Keenan Allen's not going to last in Chicago forever um, at his age and DJ Moore. Um, he doesn't have a long-term contract with Chicago, so they're going to have to decide what to do with him at some point or other. But even if DJ Moore is in Chicago long-term, teams can support two fantasy-relevant wide receivers. We've seen that plenty in the last couple of seasons. So for me, it's sticking with talent, even though – Short term, I don't think this was the best landing spot for him. But if I can get two of the top three wide receivers in the class, uh, in a class that's the best, at least at the top, the best wide receiver class we've seen in a while. We haven't seen this many wide receivers get picked in the top 10. I don't remember the last time we have. So I'm perfectly happy to get two wide receivers who are top 10 draft picks. Yeah, it's a nice spot. I mean, look, we, I think, you know, for dynasty purposes, we can debate, you know, talent and opportunity and stuff like that. But Romo Dunze, definitely one of the top talents as well, even though, yeah, right now, year one, maybe not necessarily the best spot to produce um, as a rookie. So, Kate, I mean, I know you had Odunze as your, your wide receiver to pre-draft any change to that post draft with neighbors going to the giants and, and Odunze to the bears did the landing spot and, and year one opportunity change anything for you or, or do you still feel like Odunze is the, the better long-term option here? Not in terms of dynasty value. Obviously you're going to be a little bit more reactive to that in a redraft situation where you've only got one year. So I, I look at the long-term prospects. I look at the fact that he is coming into this situation tied to Caleb Williams for the length of their rookie contracts, both of them respectively. Um, I think that's going to offer a lot of stability to Roma Dunze. I, I, I had him graded as a, a safer prospect here in this class, as opposed to a Malik neighbors who I think has a ton of flash, a ton of upside. Just like I, I look at Odunze's game and everything he does uh, from route running to uh, you know, body control, like everything he does for me is like an A minus or, or to an A. Um, maybe you have like an A plus in terms of athleticism for Malik neighbors, and that's how he wins a lot. Um, but I just think the level of refinement there is one that like talent will will ultimately win out in that situation regardless. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Um, I'm with you. Yeah, I still I I love a, a lot of these guys. Even McConkey, like uh, McConkey, I'm I obviously you know I think I had him wide receiver five coming into the the draft, and I still really like him. And obviously the landing spot, like Nick laid out, it's it's a great spot for him. But there are a couple other great wide receiver landing spots um, still to choose from. But also another top quarterback on the board here at 108, where you are picking now, Kate. So where are you going to go with this next pick? JJ McCarthy, come on down. <laughs> Thanks for leaving me uh, the, the you know, QB3, QB4, depending on your rankings here. But in a super flex, I've got to prioritize that. Nick, like you mentioned, like I, I think the athleticism, while it's not going to bolster a high ceiling for JJ McCarthy, I do think that that's going to perhaps give him a safer floor than most prospects. Like I, I could see him putting up maybe a perennial 200 rushing yards, five touchdowns. I wouldn't be surprised in the least. 
the weaponry, all things considered, I think JJ McCarthy is kind of a smash pick here for me. Um, you know, not not the same talent level as Drake May, not the same kind of upside as Drake May, but you can't really argue that he's been put in a pretty ideal situation for any rookie quarterback. Like I gotta say, Caleb Williams and JJ McCarthy, gosh darn spoiled when it comes to situation coming out. But yeah, I think JJ McCarthy is an easy one. And then I've got the next pick at the turn. So I'm this feels like my first real pick at this turn because I, I feel like JJ McCarthy doesn't even count. He was kind of a given. Um I actually so I'm I'm kind of in a situation right now where I'm struggling with the running back situation. Jonathan Brooks, my clear cut RB1. I think he has the most well-rounded skill set in this draft class among all running backs. Obviously, the torn ACL through an overall notch in his his you know overall draft stock. But like all things considered, receiving ability, pass blocking. I think he's kind of the complete package. But I keep looking at Trey Benson, especially for Dynasty. Right, like you look at his situation. He's being paired up with Kyler Murray, an ultimate rushing quarterback obviously going to be working behind James Conner in year one, who, by the way, has played just 13 games each of the last two seasons. So like not necessarily a guy who's been able to stay on the field. I'm going with Trey Benson here. Cause I think like the upside there is tremendous. I like the direction that this offense is going in. I think you do too, Nate. And I don't know. It, it's really hard to imagine that this isn't going to be a high upside offense here in the next couple of seasons. And Trey Benson with the athleticism, I mean, it's like one carry and he might, you know, force two missed tackles and he's gone. And, and that's kind of what I'm hoping for. And I think with an aging James Conner, maybe he does win that job year one. Yeah, I look, you know, I love um, Trey Benson. I, I had him as RB1 um, pre-draft. I got him and Brooks right beside each other now. I, you know, you're not necessarily loving the draft capital, right? I think it was a, a third round pick where where Brooks was a second, right? But, we, you know, again, relative to the position, we see the running back position devalued in the NFL. So second, third round picks is probably expected for these these top guys. So I, I like the opportunity, especially beyond this year. And yeah, you never know with with James Conner's health as well, what what that opportunity could lead to in year one as well. So Nate, where, where are you at with these these running backs? Did you have uh, Brooks over Con or over um, Brooks over Benson or, or Benson over Brooks? Um, how do you how do you feel about this group coming in? Uh, yeah, I did have Brooks over Benson, so um, he's the running back that I would pick first. I'm not going to pick a running back right here, though. Um, I do like Benson's long-term opportunity. I do think James Conner, uh, definitely an underrated player. He played so well last year, and just no one really paid too much attention to it because it didn't necessarily always lead to fantasy value, and people weren't paying as much attention to the Cardinals, but he just consistently week in and week out was playing well. But uh, if he does have that injury concern, so that does lead to opportunities for Benson this year. And Connor's not going to be there forever. So mm -hmm. I do think Benson, definitely the second best running back out of the class and who I'd go number two out of the running backs in Dynasty. But I at least was able to get one of the Cardinals on my team. But um, with my pick up, I'm going to go with Brock Bowers next. I'll continue just going with people that I trust to be talented, regardless of what situation they ended up in. I think the Raiders situation isn't necessarily the best, especially with Michael Mayer there. And they didn't invest a ton at the quarterback position currently, but I think tight ends who are talented find a way to be amongst the best in fantasy, regardless of what their situation is, just because there's only so many good tight ends in the league where the league is full of good wide receivers and full of good running backs. That situation plays a lot more of a role where tight ends, if you're really good, you're going to get the targets and you're going to stand out in fantasy. I think Trey McBride was a good example of that last year, regardless of the quarterback, regardless of the offense in general, he played well. And I think Bowers has that talent. So I think because of his talent, he stands out amongst all the young tight ends in the league, but also uh, definitely in this class, there weren't that great of landing spots for some of the tight ends either. A lot of the tight ends picked later. Some of them that were picked early were picked early because of the run blocking ability. So 
tight end outside of Bowers in this class is a mess. But like if you look at their PFF college grades, Bowers stands out among every one of the past decade. And if you look at all the other power five tight ends who have graded well, a ton of them are the guys that you see at the top of the fantasy ranks these past couple of years. So I trust Bowers where everyone else after this point, it's kind of hit or miss of if they'll end up working out in the NFL. I have a question for you guys. And I think this is like the one question that's been floating around in my, in my brain hemisphere since the draft, because as soon as that pick came in, I basically fell to the floor and shambled. but I keep going back and I keep thinking, what if there wasn't a tight end designation next to his name? If he were a big wide receiver and which just to be clear, like, I think that's how the Raiders intend to use him. If you drafted him into that offense alongside an aging Devontae, Devontae Adams um, with Michael Mayer, you know, presuming, presumably taking over more of the like inline traditional tight end work, more of the blocking schemes. Like I actually don't think people would have hated that fit. So like, I keep going back and forth because I wanted to see him in an ideal situation where he comes in and is the immediate tight end one, but maybe he's not the tight end one. Maybe he's the wide receiver too. And I still think that's a pretty valuable thing to be, especially in dynasty, especially when we're considering, you know, the, the fact that Devonte Adams, he's not getting any younger. Like it, it makes sense to kind of look toward the, the future of the pass catchers and, I'll I'll say it like if coming into this draft, uh, we had had him ranked as a wide receiver, he would have been my wide receiver four. So like, I don't know. I'm I keep going back and forth about how I feel about this situation because I do think like that you know they're probably planning to use him more as that wide receiver, get the ball in his hands, make plays after the catch, uh, use that explosive playmaking ability. If that's the case, then. I don't know. You're probably getting a huge value here at 110. Yeah, I think yeah. part of it's just the quarterback situation as well. Just Gardner Minshew feels like a stopgap quarterback, and we don't know what the long-term plan is for quarterback for the Raiders, where basically every other team, we know what their long-term plan is. The Raiders might be the only one where we don't know who they think is going to be their starter in 2025. So I think that's part of the situation as well. Yeah, for sure. It, it's so hard to ignore the talent, right? Like for Brock Bowers, like coming into the draft, like if you knew you were going to get him in the 10th pick of the, the, the first round without knowing the landing spot, I'm sure you would have been very happy with that as well, right? So it, we know that he's one of the best tight end prospects in, in, in recent history, and it's, it's not even particularly close. Like he's as good as they come at the position coming out of college. And we've seen him, you know, dominate targets in that Georgia offense with guys like Lad McConkey there with the Donnie Mitchell there when he was there, like he's led the team in targets three straight years since he was a freshman. So he's as good as it gets, you know, as far as earning targets himself. And, you know, regardless of the quarterback situation this year, which again, the, things change so quickly in the NFL. We don't know what this team is going to look like next year. It could be a completely different scenario. It's it's hard to ignore that. I, I love Brock Bowers as a talent. It's at a thinner position um, for fantasy at, at, at tight end as well. So I'm absolutely all for taking Brock Bowers here. Uh, um, how, how are you feeling about this one, Nick? Um, so I think part of the benefit to Bowers is his positional designation. Uh, the guy is just a far superior athlete and, and, uh, route runner, uh, than the linebackers and safeties who ideally will be tasked with covering him. So I, I understand the, um, the desire to put him, to line him up on the perimeter, but I sort of like Kyle Pitts where, yeah, he might be able to hang with NFL cornerbacks. It, using him in that way is um, you're sort of like handcuffing yourself unnecessarily by doing it. I don't know that Michael Mayer is really going to be able to keep him off the field, but he was a good prospect and he showed a little bit in his rookie season. So I, I think it was a, a pretty bad landing spot. I sort of laughed through the tears um, rather than getting upset just because I've you know, we've kind of been down this, this path before. Um, it's a bummer of an offensive environment. 
my hope is that Gardner Minshew is starting over Aiden O'Connell, although O'Connell is a very fun story. We all like the the Farva um, meme. Uh, but like he's he's gonna have to go compete with Devonte Adams J- and Jacoby Myers and um you know to some degree Michael Mayer but like Trey Tucker you know he's he's a second year guy too he could be absolutely nothing he also could be something I think it's just kind of a jumbled mess for a team that's going to they'll use heavy play action but they're not going to throw the ball a lot um I. Now I say all this and I also would have taken Brock Bowers there because of the strength of his profile. And if he does hit what you're getting from the, the tight end position is like that, that's a weak winning difference maker in that lineup. I'm pessimistic that he does this in his, in year one for all the reasons I've just outlined, but um, I don't disagree with the pick at all. I think it's a a worthwhile um, swing for the fences. Should I jump into one eleven here? Let's do it. Cool. So um, for me, uh, I still want to go after. I'm, I'm drafting Keon Coleman, Buffalo Bills wide receiver. Um, one thing that I noted in pre-draft studies was that Buffalo, if, if you look at the starting lineup, so Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, uh, Dalton Kincaid, none of them had n- – all of their average depth of target last year was under seven and a half yards. So anyone who's just decent at working in the intermediate or deep areas of the field is just going to hoover up targets. They chose a six foot four, 215 pound guy um, who has some question marks about his profile, but when he has the ball in his hands, uh, I was looking at his, his punt return data 22 missed tackles forced on 24 returns, which is a 0.9 average. That's absurd. Um, something that uh, he, he got a knock in his profile for his 4.6, 40, 4.61, 40 time, but he had a 1.54 split, 10 yard split, and he, he por- performed performed explosively in the jumping drills. Matt Waldman talked about Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Bills as being his ideal landing spot because he can get open quickly and it's a, it's a winnable depth chart. But Josh Allen is also the type of quarterback who can who can buy time on his own. So if Coleman's speed comes into uh, question here or is an issue, Allen is the kind of guy who can extend plays and give Coleman time to win against the cornerback again after he's already gotten open once on the route. So I think that this was an ideal landing spot. It's going to be interesting watching Josh Allen work with a big bodied guy early in Allen's career. They tried to basically like bridge Tyrod Taylor to him and they brought in Kelvin Benjamin and they tried to do the the big body to pass catcher thing. And it turned out that what he needed were was a bunch of separators and they, they built out the depth chart with separators, but he is a much better quarterback than he was then. Um, Coleman is another guy like Lad McConkey, who I think just waltzes into over 100 targets. Uh, could be significantly more than that, and I think that he, while the four six forty, it just kind of is what it is. Uh, I think he has the the requisite on field speed to be an excellent X wide receiver. So I'm I'm very excited to be taking him here uh, at 111. Does he have the ability to separate though? Is my question. Because uh, we'll find out. He's, he's going to get a hundred targets to do it. That's my concern. He couldn't, he couldn't separate at FSU. And like you mentioned, like Josh Allen, he likes these separators that can kind of, you know, like keep the play going. And you said like, you know, maybe they, they can connect, uh, you know, after the first time he separate. I don't even know if he's going to separate the first time around, let alone separate as the play breaks. Down. Like I, have so many concerns. I felt like there were a lot of other picks here that the Buffalo Bills could have taken um, at their original draft spot before that run on wide receivers started that would have offered probably a lot more stability to the overall offense. Because like, even in terms of target share, if he gets 100 targets and they're all 15 to 17 yards down the field, those are generally speaking going to be those lower lower completion balls like we're we're not going to expect a high efficiency rate 
he profiles for me as one of these guys that's going to have immense upside on a week to week basis. Any wide receiver catching balls from Josh Allen is, but is he going to be consistent? And I think that's a big question mark. That's just like surrounding him, surrounding the way that he plays football that I'm not convinced because he has a hilarious opening pre uh, presser that like he's going to be able to do that. I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. just like a grumpy old lady. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, you, yeah, uh, you know, I, I wasn't high on on Keon Coleman coming into the into the draft either, right? But we know whoever was going to land in Buffalo was going to get a hell of an opportunity um, to to get the ball. So we'll see how things shake out here in, in year one. I imagine that you know in future years they're going to continue to add to the position. So whether Coleman can stick as that that wide receiver one for them, we'll have to see. But I, I think he's definitely going to get the opportunity to be that guy here in year one for Buffalo. Buffalo, um, just because of the the way the depth chart is right now with Stefan Diggs and Gabe Davis uh, gone there and uh, Khalil Shakir essentially being their their top option with Dalton Kincaid. So it'll be fun um, to see how Balt, uh, see how Buffalo uses their, their wide receivers this year. Um, so to round out the first round for me, I got some options here. Um, and I think where I'm going to go. Uh, well, because I, it doesn't really matter because I get a second pick here. So I'm going to go with Xavier Worthy, um, who went to the Kansas City Chiefs in the first round. The Chiefs traded up to get uh, Worthy um, with the uh, Buffalo Bills. Um, for me, Worthy, look, I, I wasn't overly high on him coming into the draft, but there were a few landing spots that he could have went to that would be really enticing for me and Kansas City was absolutely at the top of that list just based on his skill set and how that offense operates and with the Chiefs we know they're this yards after catch um, offense where they're getting the ball to guys underneath letting them do do what they do with the ball in their hands and when you got a guy that has 421 speed that has one of the best yards after catch um, per reception marks in this class for his career at 7.3 which was a top five mark um, that just meshes perfectly well with Patrick Mahomes and that Kansas City offense so uh, I really like Xavier Worthy uh, in Kansas City here uh, there will be opportunity for him as, as a deep threat as well an area that Mahomes could definitely stand to have somebody um, to throw the ball to there reliably. And then, yeah, I, I am, uh, I'm excited about Xavier Worthy uh, again here now that he's, he's landed in Kansas city and we'll see what happens obviously with Rashi Rice um, and, and potential suspensions and things like that. But um, yeah, the, the only downside I think for me right now for, for Worthy year one, we know the chiefs kind of like to use a little bit of a rotation for their guys and not necessarily embrace them as full-time players right away. So it could be a little bit frustrating to, to start kind of like how we saw with Rashi Rice last year, but um, I, I definitely like the opportunity and the, the potential for Worthy in this offense. So that would be to, to close out the first round for me. Um, so just to recap uh, for our audio listeners who aren't watching on YouTube and can't see the draft board here. So 101, we went Caleb Williams, uh, quarterback for the Chicago Bears. Again, it is super flex. Uh, then we went Marvin Harrison at two, followed by Jaden Daniels at three, Malik Neighbors at four, Drake May at five, Lad McConkey at six, Romo Dunze at seven, JJ McCarthy at eight, Trey Benson at nine, Brock Bowers at 10, Keon Coleman at 11, Xavier Worthy at 12. So still quite a few potential fantasy assets to, to like here um, to go into the second round. Any big surprises from you guys or any favorite or at least favorite picks for you um, after round one? I don't know that I'm a little surprised that Worthy lasted this long. Everything that I've been seeing from other places, some people have been very high on Worthy. I've seen him as the fourth non-quarterback picked in a number of leagues. So I have Worthy lower in this range near the end of the first round in Superflex. So uh, just a little surprised compared to where I've seen him go in other drafts, but that's probably the biggest thing for me. Yeah, I have him as um, my ninth player in my super flex ranking. So um, just after Bowers, uh, but uh, um, after McCarthy and those guys as well. So let's kick off round two. Um, I get another pick here. I'm going to go with Jonathan Brooks. So Brooks uh, is the other running back. I think that's in consideration maybe for the first round or, or into this second round here. I know, you know, 
the year one potential for Brooks probably a little bit more encouraging than than a Trey Benson, you know, just given that Miles Sanders is there, but you know, he kind of lost his job last year um with Chuba Hubbard or to Chuba Hubbard. Chuba Hubbard, you know, he's good, not great, right? Like he doesn't scare you necessarily for opportunity. Um, but I yeah, I think there's definitely a potential here for year one for Jonathan Brooks, but I'm I am still looking at him as more of a year two prospect um that I can rely in my starting lineup for fantasy. Um it's not, you know, again, he's only got one year of college experience as a starter. He's coming off the ACL. So there there's reasons to to temper expectations with him, but I still really like the the long-term potential here for for Brooks and Carolina. Um, all right, number two, second uh, pick of the second round. Nick, who do you got? Yeah, so um, this is where things get fun because I think the uh, we're we're going to be kind of influencing ADP here a little bit. Um, I am I'm very torn, but I'm going to gamble that another guy that I like will be here uh, or will be available a few picks from now. So right now I'm going to go Jalen Polk. New England Patriots, new X wide receiver. What I like about this this landing spot, uh, New England brought over a couple of guys uh, to run the offense. Ben McAdoo, and I'm blanking on the uh, OC's name, but um, both of these guys are they. Uh, oh, oh, Van Pelt, Alex Van Pelt. Both of these guys feature uh, three wide receiver sets as their their base formation. Typically, that's not necessarily a great thing for rookies because you'd rather have them earning targets against tight ends uh, and running backs. But I think that given the Patriots' current pass-catching infrastructure, the three wide receiver set reliance is actually going to get these guys onto the field earlier and allow someone to separate uh, along with Demario Douglas, who may just get bumped out of two wide receiver sets, although I think he's currently their best like NFL pass catcher on the team. Um, but they're, they're competing with Kendrick Bourne and Juju Smith Schuster who are perfect. Uh, can you beat these guys type of players for rookies to go compete against? Cause they're not very good, but they're, they are, you know, veteran dependable enough that they can take reps away from an undeserving rookie. So I think Polk, he slides in on the perimeter as the number one uh, wide receiver very quickly in this offense. Uh, I am optimistic on Drake May's passing ability, and I think that that Van Pelt and McAdoo can give him a a workable scheme. So uh, Polk, I think, is the the best bet among the current New England pass catchers to be leading the team in in targets per game uh, by the end of this year, and and you know assuredly week one of uh, the following season. Nice. Yeah, it looks like we're all getting a little bit skeptical about the first round wide receivers, right? The uh, the Xavier Leggett's and, and the Ricky Pearsalls, right? And, and 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 look, the second round, what, 37th overall, I think, Jalen Polk. So it's not like he's far from the first round either, right? He's absolutely in that conversation, especially if you're, you're you know, worried about the red flags because there absolutely are red flags with some of those guys. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't mind the pick here. How are you guys feeling about uh, the, the next pick? I think uh, Kate is, or no, Nate's up uh, for this is me. I'm not sure if you purposely omitted one of the first round rod receivers, hoping he'd slide to you, but I'm going to go with Brian Thomas. For no, one right, that was no, <laughs> undo. Oh, yeah, he was the fourth wide receiver on our big board, the fourth wide receiver on consensus big boards, the fourth wide receiver selected in the draft. And I think Jacksonville's a fine enough landing spot. Trevor Lawrence at times has played like an elite quarterback. He's also been at times an okay quarterback. So not exactly sure what we'll get out of Trevor Lawrence this year, but they do have a need at outside wide receiver. Of course, Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram are great on the inside, but Last year, Calvin Ridley was able to be a uh, top, I think, 20 wide receiver in terms of fantasy production, even though it was a little inconsistent a couple weeks where he was very good and plenty of weeks where you probably wish you didn't start him. But I think there's potential for an outside wide receiver in Jacksonville and considering how everyone has viewed him in terms of talent in this wide receiver class, I am perfectly happy to get him in the second round since there were so many first round wide receivers that some of them will get to the second round, even in... Uh, single quarterback dynasty drafts. 
yeah no he he wasn't he he was he's definitely included in the, those first round red flags but absolutely a, a, a good great value here um in in the second round i have him as my uh 10th player in um in super flex rankings and actually i have him ahead of jonathan brooks so that's on me um for for letting him also uh fall to you um but uh kate you're up here next at uh 204 where are you going you'd say it sounded like you wanted to go brian thomas jr a little bit. Yeah. I, I love uh, the fit too. like the player. I have my question marks about him and that's why he wasn't, you know, sitting right alongside Roma Dunze, Malik neighbors in my rankings, but the upside is tremendous. He's got elite size speed combination. He's with a very good NFL quarterback and like from a, a scheme perspective, like can play a very different role than Christian Kirk is going to play in this offense. They just really say Jones, like I, I think this is kind of an ideal situation for him, given the skill set. It's not very duplicative. Um, so yeah, I wanted Brian Thomas, and I was praying that nobody would say his name prior to Nate's pick, but here we are. So now I have to zag, and I might be zagging too hard, and I want y'all to feel free to drag me. Um, if I'm sagging too hard i'm gonna go with malachi corley wide receiver for the jets who i love the skill set like has more than earned his standing as the yak king goes to the new york jets who desperately need a solid true wide receiver too and he's a guy that i think you can generate touches for get the ball in his hands and let him make the plays after the catch um you know rob sala who knows how long his his tenure will last here with the Jets, but um, you'll remember, you know, despite his his defensive kind of background, like he's from the Shanahan system. He's seen how to use this prototype of wide receiver, a la Adebo Samuel, um, where you can kind of generate those touches and just see what happens with them. I think there's a chance that like maybe Malachi Corley ranks probably top five among all of these wide receivers and targets in the coming year, given their needs. And I don't know. I feel like nobody's talking about Malachi Corley. Loved him as a prospect, loved him in the skill set. I love the situation. Like, why aren't we all higher on Malachi Corley? Yeah, he wasn't like one of my like favorites coming coming into the draft. He was more like to me, just profiled more as like a screen merchant type guy. But like, not that that can is necessarily a bad thing either for fantasy. Like, it's a reason to get the ball in the guy's hands and and to give him some production and and let him do something with it. So there's definitely opportunity there. I know you know Garrett Will, Garrett Wilson and um, uh, Mike Williams are, are are likely the top two to to start this season, but we know Mike Williams obviously not staying healthy very often, and there's going to be potential. They they spent up to get this guy. Um, they want to get the ball in his hands, use him in creative ways, so that can lead to fantasy production as well. So, um, yeah, that's uh, I, I like it. And who who do we have next? I think Nate. Yeah, coming back to Nate now. Oh, uh, Kate gets another one. Oh no, Kate. Get, oh, sorry. I yeah. Oh, there you go, one. Kate. You get a free. Oh my one gosh. Well. <laughs> Dag nab. Um, this is an this is an interesting position. Um, well, I hadn't really been thinking about my next pick because I <laughs> thought it was that we're moving on. Um, but I will go ahead and I am going to make a pick. And that pick, I think, again, one of these guys that like I might be reaching here. And this is a guy that uh, maybe I'm being a homer about. I'm going to go with Roman Wilson of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, love, love, love the the fit here with Roman Wilson. I have a little bit of concern in terms of like fantasy upside, just given the offense he's being drafted to. This is a team that wants to run the ball and ram it down opponents' throats. Um, and unfortunately, like his willingness to block and eagerness in that department only feeds into that model further. Um, but this is a bet on talent. This is a, a, a you know, thought that Roman Wilson's skill set, like he could play out of the slot, but I think he's a true, um, you know, like deep threat out of the slot. He can play in the intermediate range. Uh, just love everything about his game. And I, I don't think. You know, I, I think the Steelers so badly needed a role player in that middle of the field that I don't really think they've had since Juju Smith-Schuster. 
Nice. Yeah. Even while you were buying time there for your pick, I was trying to pull up the screen. I was just going to do like, like mouse cursor circles around Roman Wilson to try to tempt you, but it turns out it didn't even need to be done. No, yeah. I, I took yeah. the bait. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nate, where are you going at, uh, at two Oh six here? Uh, I'm going to go with Bo Nix here. Finally get a quarterback. Um, I agree that all the other quarterbacks that have been picked so far should get picked a decent amount before Bo Nix. I have Bo Nix as a second round player in these super flex dynasty drafts, but there are plenty of years where it's the quarterbacks that are get that get picked fourth or fifth that end up being the better quarterbacks in the class. So even though I think most people agree that the other quarterbacks are the people to get over Bo Nix, I'm happy to take a chance that we're all wrong and, Knicks being the 12th overall pick in the draft, it's not very often that you can get the 12th overall pick who is a quarterback this late in a dynasty rookie draft. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I think Bo Nix would have definitely been um, the play for me as well. Like just as, as far as him being a starting quarterback in the NFL, that that becomes valuable for for Superflex. And a lot of people saying that he got the best wide receiver in the draft as well, which is interesting um, with Troy Franklin uh, reuniting there. But um, Nick, where are you going now at, uh, at 207? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, San Francisco 49ers, new excellent number of whatever, it's future number one wide receiver, Ricky Pearsall. Um, so uh, Pearsall is a guy that I was debating at uh, 202. Um, he was one of my draft darlings. He is he's an exceptional route runner, uh, crazy freak athlete. What I really like about uh, Pearsall and this landing spot, though, I, I you can Debo being there. It, they do create a problem, at, at least in terms of early production. Um, I, and I can't imagine that either one of those two guys actually gets traded. I, I know that's been kind of a, a hot thing for a long time. I just, uh, relinquishing your grasp on elite wide receivers is not a smart thing to do. Uh, and they're a fairly smart organization. Anyway, um, Pearsall, what I like about him is that he, he, he wins ba just based on his route running ability and he stays on time. That is exactly what you need to do to get on the field quickly um, in the Kyle Shanahan scheme. Now, Brandon Ayuk, of course, he stayed on time uh, early in his career, but he had, I guess, some attitude things that Shanahan, Shanahan had to take a year to punish him for. Hopefully that doesn't uh, happen with Pearsall. I think that his on, the, the way that he wins is exactly what Kyle Shanahan um, wants. And my favorite little, uh, people on Twitter have probably seen me talk about this. My favorite thing with, with Pearsall was he dominated when his quarterback was under pressure. Uh, I he was, uh, let's see here. It was among, uh, power five wide receivers with at least 20 pressured targets. Uh, he ranked top two in explosive pass plays, catch rate and yards per out run. So he was just there when he, when his quarterback needed him to be. And, um, I, I, and I think any of the Shanahan trees would have been a really fun place for Pearsall to land. But the fact that he actually gets to go to San Francisco is awesome. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be getting him middle of round two. Nice. Yeah. Love it. Um, yeah, that'll be a fun one for sure. Um, so I guess that leaves me here with probably Xavier Leggett. Um, who's the last first round uh, wide receiver. We know I not wasn't crazy about Leggett again, another one coming into the draft with, with enough red flags to, to be concerned about. But again, first round wide receiver here, there's definitely potential. Kate kind of sold him, uh, sold me on him uh, on our last episode as well, kind of given his backstory a, a little bit. And look, his last year, I know it was a fifth year um, breakout, but it, it was a really strong year, 3.15 yards per route run. 1,255 receiving yards. So Carolina obviously felt pretty good about him to, to trade up into the first round. I think there's going to be the opportunity there for him in Carolina as well. So Xavier Leggett um, is going to be 208 for me. And then 209 is really tough because part of me wants to go Michael Penix Jr. just because it's super flex and he got top 10 draft capital in the draft debatable whether it, that was the right move but you know what screw it i i'm gonna go with jermaine burton um because i i really like burton's play on the field um obviously that being you know the biggest thing because there are some off-field um 
question marks with him, but on the field, I really like the potential when you're pairing him with a Joe Burrow. T. Higgins doesn't seem destined to be there long term. Um, obviously, Tyler Boyd is not there either. So I think there's definitely potential in a high end offense for Jermaine Burton, not necessarily this year, but beyond that, as long as he can keep everything together and stay out of trouble, like this is kind of the a perfect spot for him to to emerge as a fantasy relevant option um, beyond year one. So uh, I'm going with uh, with Jermaine Burton here. I, I, he might be our first um, round three pick. Oh no, uh, I guess yeah, Benson was around three. So um, oh no, Roman Wilson as well. So there we go. Okay, so I don't I don't feel too bad. Um, yeah, I Jermaine think I'm Burton. Just stealing all of the third round picks. I'm glad that you. <laughs> Yeah, you, I'm, you I'll took jump in. One on of that. them from me. <laughs> I will jump in on a third round pick. Why not? So uh, that's 208 and 209 for me. Nick, right back to you here for 210. Yeah. So I had planned on on taking um, Kamani Vidal here, but uh, you guys left Michael Penix. So I will just kind of hit the single here. Um, I think I really like Penix as a, a prospect. Uh, and I was extremely impressed with his his pro day numbers. I didn't really know what to expect there, uh, just based on his lack of rushing profile. But the guy is an elite sack avoider. Uh, he flashed serious speed and burst at the pro day, and his passing talents. I I guess like there's there's some um, holes you can kind of poke in some of his like deep middle passing, but I. The guy just looks like a, a prototypical cannon armed quarterback prospect. Obviously he's probably not starting this year and it'll be um, unlikely for him to start the following season. But I do think that um, Achilles tendon ruptures, I, I probably put too much weight on them across. I don't know. Kirk cousins probably comes back and has a good year this year but he is over 30 years old. He's coming back from an Achilles. I don't think it's necessarily a given. I was listening to uh, Edwin uh, fantasy points, talk about how it's on his uh, plant leg. So that's, that's a little bit more worrying than it, than it being on uh, the opposite leg. Um, so I, I don't know if it's just a, a 100% guarantee that cousins is cousins this year. Uh, that said, even if he is, I think that they, the organization could still trade him away. And yes, they would have a massive um, dead money hit in what is that? 2025, but they would still be saving uh, like $60 million down the road. So there's some, what of an offset there regardless. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take Penix and um, just hope that he gets on the field next year, I guess. <laughs> I like it. No, I, I'm glad I left Penix um, for you, Nick, because you gave a, a more uh, convincing argument than than I would have Thank as you. well. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, look, I, I would have been. Well, he's a quarterback. <laughs> basically, yeah, that would have been. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, but the, you got to like the weapons there for him in Atlanta as well when he does, um, potentially take over at, in that starting role. So it, he's definitely somebody that you you're looking at in the second round of a super flex, I, I think is absolutely in play here. Um, so, uh, Nate, you got two eleven here. Uh, this will be probably the last one for, for, for you in this draft. Who are you taking? Oh uh, yeah. Penix would have been my pick as well here, but since I can't get him, uh, for the next five guys in my rankings that are available are running backs, but there's still one more wide receiver that I'm too tempted to take here, and that's Adone Mitchell. Indianapolis Colts, the last of the second-round wide receivers, I believe, and last uh, not of all the second-round skill players. There's still a tight end available, but uh, Mitchell, he was the fourth guy on our big board for our, the draft, so he fell a little bit compared to where we thought. I know consensus, he fell a little bit too. Uh, Indianapolis, maybe not the most ideal landing spot, but he should be able to win the starting job over Alec Pierce at some point, I would think. So I wouldn't be surprised if he is a full-time starter pretty early on in the season, which will give him some opportunities. So just kind of a case of if he works out, then he could have a ton of fantasy production or he could be a backup for most of the year and continue to be a borderline starting player throughout his career. So I'm willing to take a chance on him. Uh, just considering where he was drafted and where we had him on our big board and the talent we think he has. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about it pre-draft. Like we, we like the the potential 
for him, you know, for his talent to emerge down the road is just what you're paying to get that potential. And I, I think this is more of the right spot for him um, to be drafted because he was talked about as a potential first round pick. Right. So um, th- this spot, I think, you know, and the draft capital in, in the NFL draft makes a little bit more sense for him and it makes him a safer pick here um, and with with more upside as well. So I'm with you. And and look, the Colts, they're, they're another one of those teams like Nick mentioned with with Jalen Polk and with the Patriots that run a, a lot more 11 personnel i think there's going to be potential for him to get on the field if he can beat out alec pierce as well so kate to bring us home here end of the second round who is the final player off the board there are a couple of really interesting names here i want to shout out troy franklin uh who john i know you love i have been less skeptical or or more skeptical of and and much less certain and at what wait 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 I'm making the case. So I understand the the profile, right? I understand uh, that he excelled very well in all the things he was asked to do in Oregon's offense, but he wasn't asked to do a wide variety of things. The The route running is a concern. It showed up, uh, you know, at the combine. But like, if you watch it, like he, he produced on, you know, what, three or four routes. And that was kind of his whole profile he produced very well on those routes i'm gonna like give him some bonus points with the fact that he was paired up with his college quarterback which i think is a probably an underrated narrative with that comfort level that you're gonna see you know as these two pair up um gonna be a lot more inclined to probably throw it up and and sling it down the field for him than maybe a Cortland sutton who generates less separation that being said i'm going with audrick estime who oh. maybe uh, it is like a surprise, but I actually think outside of some of the top running backs that we've already talked about in this draft, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, I actually think despite the fact that he fell in the draft a bit, a landing spot with the Denver Broncos, not a bad situation given their, their, you know, standing as a, a rebuild offense, you have Javante Williams entering the final year of his rookie contract I think Estime has true like three down potential that fell in the draft because of that, that 40 time. I like it. I like the, the landing spot. I really like the player. So I, maybe it's a reach here because you don't necessarily have to draft him that early. But again, in this kind of draft situation where there is no consensus, I just want to get my guys and Audrick Estime is my guy. I love it. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, I, I think I'm with you, right? Like once you get into this kind of back half of the second round and then beyond that, like you're definitely looking more for who you like. And, and cause there's a lot of close ones. There's a lot of reasons not to like these guys with red flags. Right. So there's, there's absolutely some potential to emerge here that, that could end up being nice values. Once we look back on these drafts um, a year from now or two years from now. So to recap um, that second round, it started with Jonathan Brooks. Then we went to Jalen Polk. Then the third pick was Brian Thomas jr. Followed by Malachi Corley. Roman Wilson in the 205, 206 was Bo Nix, 207 Ricky Pearsall, 208 Xavier Leggett, 209 Jermaine Burton, 210 Michael Penix Jr., and 211 was Adonai Mitchell, and then to close it out, Audrick Estime at 212. So we, we're going to try to keep it at about an hour today, so we're going to only do the the, the, t- the first two rounds here, but just to quickly recap before we let everybody go, I just want to get everyone's kind of maybe favorite pick that they made um maybe outside of the top four um that that were that are a little bit more chalky but who was your favorite pick um that you made in this draft or at least where you got them in this draft um nate i'll I'll start with you i'll go with brian thomas got him near the start of the second round i have him as my ninth overall player in my rankings for these so uh just being able to get the consensus wide receiver for that late in the draft and uh pretty decent landing spot for him so i was happy with that pick nice yeah that was definitely a a nice value there uh nick how about you so yeah i uh i was all excited to to triumphantly talk about kamani vidal and then then everything (laughs) panned out this way so i I feel freed in uh in some way probably lad i uh 
Yeah, I think probably Lad McConkey. I think I think that one was exciting. I'm I'm very optimistic on uh, Justin Herbert just locking onto mm-hmm. this guy, um, and I, you know, he had some questions about the profile, but I think he, um, I think we're going to be talking about him as a you know borderline uh, top twelve guy entering uh, 2025. Yeah, he's he's such a fun player. I, I love Lad McConkey. That that landing spot is really really juicy. And look, yeah, it's it's high the highest I've seen him go as well. But like we've been saying, right? Like there hasn't really been a consensus. We've seen all these different variations of the first round, even. So, um, in a case where you're going to get your guy and believing in the opportunity and the combination of with his talent, um, I absolutely like it. Uh, Kate, how about you? What was your your uh, favorite pick here of the two rounds that we did? I'm going to be honest from a value standpoint, I kind of hate my draft. Like I, (laughs) I feel like I reached a lot. I got my guys, which is good. And I think this is kind of like my approach heading into the season. But if I had to pick one, I'm probably going to go with JJ McCarthy, who I got at the 108. I just think the value, especially in a super flex league for a guy that I do think is going to be a, a long-term starter. Like I, I don't, necessarily project him as a guy that's going to step into this loaded offense and have a ton of question marks in year one. I think, I think this is going to be his job and I think he's going to be the Vikings quarterback for the length of his rookie contract. If my evaluation of him is at all, even in the neighborhood of accurate, I'll take that kind of value in a super flex any day. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I, I was really between McCarthy and May when I picked there as well. So it, it's super close with those guys. Um, for me, I I guess Xavier Worthy. Um, I, I have him as my my number nine player. Got him at 12. So it's not like it was a huge jump or anything. We only got two rounds of, of sample size here to deal with. But I, I did like the I did like the value of Xavier Worthy there at the, the end of the first round. I think there will be people that are, that are even more excited about him um, just because of the offense that he lands on with the best quarterback in the league so um that makes him pretty interesting to me but other than that that is going to do it for us um today so we'll what i'll do i'll take a screenshot of this uh this draft board we'll we'll share it on on the twitter when we send out the um the episode tweet or the episode post um as well so that way people could look at it there as well if you're following along just uh, via audio um but for those of you on the youtube channel please feel free to give us uh some help by liking and subscribing to the channel as well we'd greatly appreciate that also feel free to sound off in the comments if you if you'd like uh, um us to do it again or maybe a one qb format something like that as well let us know you know what picks you change or or agree with we're, we're happy to interact with folks um and and we thank you for tuning in Nick's gone. Nick, Nick disappeared. Uh, is he cut out there? Uh, Nick has some uh, stuff written up here on PFF.com as well. And I think he's at Nick Botiford uh, NFL on Twitter. Um, so uh, Kate, how about you? Where, what, please let everybody know what you got going on this fantasy draft season. Yeah, I'm uh, writing up five veterans that won the NFL draft. That'll be dropping on PFF on Wednesday. Um, give me a follow on Twitter at Kate Majuk. That's M-A-G-D-Z-I-U-K. Awesome stuff. Nate, before you go, please remind everybody what else you got going on at PFF.com as well. Oh, yeah, I have plenty of rankings going up. Uh, Dynasty rankings, Dynasty rookie rankings, Superflex, Superflex rookie. I'll have a trade value chart this week as well. Uh, Next week, I'll also do update of my PPR rankings, and then I also plan on doing a write-up of the mock draft that we just did. So you can get even more of my opinions when I write that up for next week beautiful awesome stuff yeah as for me got the rookie rankings up there as well for for one qb and super flex rookie drafts um idp rookie rankings are now on the site as well tomorrow or wednesday i should say um we'll have the combined offense and idp rookie rankings with a a seven round draft strategy board so that'll be up there wednesday um and then i'll be back in the feed uh friday morning reviewing and ranking the rookie edges um for idp with my guy joey the tooth from football guys so be sure to check that out as well if you're into idp But until then, thank you all again for tuning in and peace out.